Okay, I guess we can go ahead and get started a little earlier and then we can get out earlier. <laughs> I'm Elvira Deamport and thank you for joining me in my Skype in the Gifted Classroom presentation. I teach Gifted, obviously, at Hattiesburg Public Schools. We serve second through sixth grade students and we love to incorporate technology in our class and I hope that you get a lot of this presentation. I'm just here to share my love for Skype and some resources that have worked for me throughout my journey with technology. So with a show of hands, how many of you have used Skype with your family? And your we'll just start with family first, family and friends, okay? How many of you used it with your classes? Yay, yay, okay, good, good. How many of you have heard of Skype, but you haven't used it in your classes or in your own personal life? Good, okay. So this is just, keep in mind when we're talking about, you're gonna see a lot of these technology, we have great sessions here at NAGC with technology. You're gonna be seeing a lot of tools for those of you who are new. I'm new myself to all kinds of online tools and just keep in mind, pick out what you think will work for your students. So as I'm talking today, really think about your context and who you teach and the children you serve. And think about, will this work for my students? And think about ways that you can modify because all I'm giving you is resources and tips, but you have to make it your own. Because I did the same thing when I was trying to learn Skype and what to do with it, I had no clue. <laughs> now I'm doing a lot more than I used to with the help of other teachers and what I've seen online. So, but I've also modified throughout my journey to see what's going to work with my kids. And just don't, don't you don't have to follow what everyone else does. So just think about what's going to work for your kids. And a few things to get to get started that you will need. Skype does require a little bit of equipment, but not too much fancy equipment like video conferencing. I don't know if you've heard of video conferencing. They require a lot more money and equipment with that. So I like Skype because it's free. It's a video chat tool that you download for free, and you just need some pretty basic stuff. People think it's a lot more than it really is. So basically, you need obviously your laptop with your internet connection. You're going to need your projector of some sort because it's better when you have larger classes to have that projector. Because people, if you have smaller classes, you may come around the computer. But it's not always ideal to huddle. Come on, come in, y'all. Don't be shy. It's not always ideal to huddle around the computer when you're trying to chat with another group or someone on the computer. So I suggest that projector. It doesn't have to be fancy. To project something with the screen to see the people on the other side. You also need a webcam. A lot of computers nowadays, a lot of Macs and newer versions of computers already come with your webcam. But see, mine's a little ancient. My little down is ancient. I have to use just a simple webcam, and I use a Logitech. I think it's 9100 so it's like 60 bucks at Walmart so it's nothing fancy but it's a good little camera it's worked for me and it has your microphone right here embedded so that'll work I like to use speakers too because when you're talking and you have larger class sizes and depending on your internet connection it may not it might not be good to hear with just your computer speakers you're gonna need those external speakers so that your class can hear the, per the people on the other line and then if you have an external mic I've come to find out from personal experience. This isn't always the best when we have bad connection days because the other end we hear a lot of, what did you guys say? So I have to invest in another Logitech external mics. Have you seen those mics that are kind of long, that kind of come out? You just plug them in. So that's what I'm investing in this year. And that was like 40 bucks, I think. So it wasn't very expensive. And of course, you just need a wall, a screen, or a board. People think, a lot of teachers think, I need that Promethean board or that Smart board. You don't need it because you're just looking at them. It's not an interactive thing when you're Skyping. It is interactive in the sense of communicating, but you don't need that interactive whiteboard to communicate. You can use a screen like this. I have a projection screen just like this in my classroom. You can use a smart board, Promethean board, or a wall. My friends in Argentina, they use a wall because they don't have fancy boards like us. So those are a few things to have. Then, to get started, here's a website, Skype.com, pretty simple. You can download the latest version for Macs, PCs, it's free. They update a lot, so I suggest that you play with it a little bit before you start making phone calls because I get, oh, I get nervous when they change it. I'm like, where did this button go? And you don't want to do that last minute. You don't want to freak out last minute. So go on there, download it for your computer, your whatever you're using. And here are some of the features that you want to become familiar with. It's pretty basic. It's a screenshot right there. It's kind of hard to see. But a lot of the versions, they have what's called a toolbar right here. So you call. You have your video call, which is like a little green button, and that's when you want to see people. So then you have your voice call, and I do that sometimes with my friends, my teacher friends, when they're not in the mood for me to see them or their house, <laughs> they just say, we're just going to call you with the voice. It's kind of like a telephone call. It's free. And you don't get to see the person on the other line, though. You see like their little profile picture. But ideally for your students, I would recommend that video call. 
And that voice call is just to kind of practice or do personally. Then you have what's called a group call, and that, they charge you for that. It's a special feature that Skype offers. And I've done that once with my teacher friends, just to kind of get to know them. But I haven't done it in the classroom setting. But it is possible to do it in the classroom setting. Then you have your chat feature when you have your screen come up. See, right here is an example of a group call. You backtrack. See the three screens? You can do up to 10 people, too, with the group call, which is pretty cool to do a lot of people, a lot of callers. But when you normally Skype, you usually see your person come up. And then I would show you if I had internet, but we don't have internet in the room. Then you have your box down here, somewhere in the corner or down on this side. And then you have a chat box sometimes if you want to enunciate, like if there's problems with you can't hear because of the internet connection again or you just can't understand what they're saying on the other line, it's good to use that chat feature to type in what you just said. You say, hold on, let me just tell you again. You just type it in. Or you can type in links. I do a lot of that with my friends when I do it personally. I type in my little links at the bottom. I'm like, oh, have you seen this blog? And they're like, I don't know what you're talking about. I said, hold on. And I just paste it right there. And they're like, oh, I got it. Okay. So it's really a neat feature to have. Then you have your share screen feature. And basically, it's just you share your screen. And you, I'm going to show you an example later on in our projects. This works well with classes when you have illustrations, your students draw something. It's not the best thing for them to come up to the camera to show because you can't really see the detail. And a lot of times it's dark in the room. So what I do ahead of time, I scan a lot of their pictures if they're going to share. And then I use that screen sharing feature to blow it up. And then the other class on the other end, they're like, oh, we see your screen. That they think it's the coolest thing when you share your screen. They're like, oh, that's so cool. We can see your screen. And then they see our picture, which is nice. So I use it for that mostly. But a warning, with you, when you're going to share a screen, if you're going to share something, make sure that your whatever document you have is open, your web page is open, because it's very delayed. Especially if you have internet connection like us, sometimes it's just so slow, and it takes forever to get to your page. So have all that ready in advance before you make your call, so that when you're ready to share that screen, it's right there. You don't have to dig for it and waste the time. Then you have something called the shared documents. Um, feature. I haven't used it as much. I don't know if anyone in here has used it. But it's also, you just, I guess you just share your document. It's just there. I haven't used it. I would play with it. I recommend that you play with it. But like my top three, of course, the calls, the chat, and the share screen are my top three tools. And a lot of, before it used to be, we used to find all this in the toolbar, but they changed it. Like I said, they keep updating. So play with it a little bit. It's going to be usually at the top. And it's different for Macs and PCs, too. So I recommend you just play with it. Get, familiar with it before you call. See if I'm on the right page. You're not on the right page. Yep, always. So now that you have your, let's say you have your program downloaded, you're ready to go, your question is, how do I find people who want to Skype with me or my classes? So I recommend you start, for those of you who raise your hand and have friends already and relatives, start with people that you know and do a practice session. It doesn't hurt. Call up your parents or your friend and say, are you available at 12? Let's do a quick Skype call. Just so your kids can kind of see what it looks like, get a feel for the tool. And then also, too, this is a teacher that I follow on Twitter. I don't know if any of you um, are on Twitter. I'm at L Gifted, by the way. If you go on Twitter a lot, it's while we're here. Yeah. Yay! <laughs> OK. <laughs> but I follow um, at Languages, which is Silvia Tolisano out of Jacksonville, Florida. She is amazing with just all kinds of tools. And here's a picture of her right here. It's one of her websites. She suggested, actually, if you're new to this, split up your group into two, and then Skype, like say if you're in one class, Skype another class in the same building or the same district, just to practice. You know, it doesn't have to be anything fancy. And just to get your kids to look to see what it looks like and things like that. Come on in. Come on in. So that's another thing to do. To get, to get comfortable, let you play with the little features if you want. So there's no pressure in knowing everything before you call, you know, other people. So that's a great way to start. Start with people that you know. But here are my top, my top five. I love these right here. Number one, I recommend you check out Skype in the Classroom. How many of you are already part of the community? Anyone? Oh, you have to go. It's, it's wonderful. It's wonderful for people around the nation and the country. It's wonderful for global contacts. Great site, and it's already in tune with your Skype. So when you set up your Skype account, when you go log into this site, you type in your Skype login name. You see? So when you find someone, I found like a few people on here, someone from New Zealand, I was like, ooh, this looks interesting. I automatically added him to my Skype contact list. So it lets you do that. So this is number one for me. And here, what you do, basically, you create an account with your, with your Skype first, and then you just log in with your Skype account with that site, because it's strictly for educators. 
and you can do what's called a project. <coughs> so you create your own project, and you can be as specific or as general as you want to be. You can say, I just want to Skype with someone, and we are in Texas. And you will find responses left and right. They can contact you on the page. <laughs> or what I like to do personally, I leave my email everywhere. I said, just email me, because I'll never log in. or I'll forget to log in. A lot of people just forget to log in. I said, just email me if you're interested, and let me know if you want to Skype. And I get emails left and right. And they also, also if you want to do that option, when they email you, I tell them, please tell me what project you're interested in, because I have like five projects going on at the same time. And so a lot of times they message me, Skype in the Classroom Book Club project. And so I know it's a legit email and not spam. So when you do that, make sure that when you email someone that you're interested in, in your title page, make sure that you put, you know, or somewhere in your email say, Skype, I found you a Skype education project or something to let them know that you're not spam. So this is a wonderful, wonderful site. A lot of people, it's grown, it's fast growing too. Another two, other two you'll see in your packet, CILC and CAPSpace stands for Collaborations Around the Planet, and this one stands for Center for Interactive Learning and Collaboration. These are more video conferencing sites. I haven't found, I found more luck with the CILC one because again, I left my email, and it's strictly for video conferencing, but I say specifically, when I get on here and I create a project just like Skype, I say, I use Skype. And so if you want to Skype with me, email me here, and then they just email me from here. Same thing with this one, you can create a project and be as specific or as general as you want to be. And another favorite one is kind of a smaller community, but it's wonderful because it was started by my favorite person, Silvia Torizano, is around the world with 80 schools. And this one has a lot of great global people. I mean, a lot of people I found around the world are here. And it's such a small community. It's like Facebook when you log in. It used to be a name if you're familiar with names, but now it's just a regular website. And you can create your little profile and have your little friends. You can follow people kind of like Facebook. So it's a little easier to manage. This one's like very easy to manage when you get on. This one's easy to manage. These are a little more complicated. But if you want to try them out, I recommend you do them. I have accounts for all five or four. So, but I really don't check back, so I recommend that you leave your email if you're an email person. So just specify that in your project. And then other two good places to do, Twitter. If you're on Twitter, I'm always on Twitter. I always tell people, hey, you want to come for this? We're doing a project on this. And that's all, and instant feedback on Twitter. So, and also with Facebook, are y'all familiar with Mary's Gifted Contacts? It's a gifted group. That's what it's called, Mary's Gifted Contacts. So if you log in, leave Mary a message. She's out of New Zealand, and she has a very growing community. And we all started here first. She started on Twitter. She's Mary St. George, if you all know her on Twitter. And she's out of um, New Zealand, and she does actually, I think she runs an online school. So she's really up for technology projects and trying to expose her children to other gifted, other gifted learners. So she's a wonderful, wonderful resource. So just check her out and just tell her that you went to my session and she'll let you join the group. But it's a Facebook group and you post anything, all things related to gifted. So that would be a great place to start too, if you're on Facebook a lot. Any questions so far about this? So when you think about Skype, it's a way, there's a way to think of it, it's like organized. I think of it as a structure, and you want to create a learning experience out of it. You don't want to Skype just for the sake of Skyping. Of course, you have your practice calls, which is something different, but you don't want to make your whole Skype experience for your children just pointless. You want to make sure it enriches what you're doing and complements your curriculum, because that's when the students really get something out of it, and that's what I believe. We're not just going to Skype just to Skype. We have to have a reason to do it. And so the structure that I have in my mind is when I think of a Skype call, when I plan for it or I think about it, I think there's a pre-call, certain things you have to do for the pre-call, during the call, and post-call. So certain steps you have to take. There we go. So during the pre-call, obviously, for number one, you're going to arrange it, and you can do it via those sites I gave you. So that's when you start meeting people, connecting with them, give them your email, things like that, and then tell them kind of what you're looking for. And so you schedule your call. And make sure you know your time zones, because we're going to start getting into this funny stuff. I'm so bad with time zones, especially with the time changes. Ugh. It messes me up. I just say, what time is it over there right now? So I just know. <laughs> and so that's how we get together and figure it out with my friends. And then you obviously want to prepare your topic. So you want to make sure it fits along with what you're doing. You don't want to do something too out there. Because you don't want to over plan. You don't want to plan something that you're not doing. You want to make sure it's in line with what you're doing with your students. And then with number three, come on in if you want to come in. And number three is you can research your geographic location. Because part of this for me, for my students, we need that exposure. My students really don't leave the state very much. They don't travel very much. 
So for this, for them, it's kind of like a window for them to see the world. And so this is actually a picture from my classroom. I have a little map. This is just one map. My students took this picture for a blog post. So we have our little state map, our United States map, and we label. It's very hard to see, but I have these little sticky notes. We label each location that we Skype with. We have them look it up. They label it, and then I say, what well, grade level? Like third grade did Canada. Uh, our sixth graders did California. So they just label the map and it helps them with their geographic skills in the process. And I also have a world map on the other side of my room for the world contacts too that are not included in this map. So that's important for them to know that, to get a sense of global awareness. And then you also want to prepare your students. You just don't want to say, okay guys, we're going to Skype tomorrow. No, you want to sit down with them and say, okay, we're going to Skype with so-and-so and talk about body language. Respect is a big thing for me. It's like, you have to watch what you say. You know, it's okay to be enthusiastic, but you also want to hear, you know, people on the other end of the line. You don't want to be disrespectful. So, and also too, the body language is so huge, because I used to put the camera, because you can position your camera any way. You can put the camera to face everyone, and if you have someone in the back kind of like slumping, that's just not very nice. I tell them, it's not very nice. You know, especially if they're sharing projects with you. How would you feel? I tell them, how would you feel if someone was just staring off or talking to their buddy? when you work so hard for your project, to present this project, it wouldn't make you feel good. So, so think, I tell, I tell them, think about those things. So you establish those expectations. And then you also, another thing I really can't wait to talk about is Skype jobs. You can assign your Skype jobs during the pre-planning stage. And let me get into Skype jobs. Has anyone heard of Skype jobs before? Okay, this is big on Twitter. I got this from Twitter. I cheat, so I just get what I said. I just steal their ideas and I make it my own. So I'm here to share the wonderful Skype jobs. We love Skype jobs. So Skype jobs, what can you do? So in the beginning, when you first Skype with your classes, when they're fairly new to the whole idea of Skype, and like I did when I first started, it was usually everyone in the class, we're gonna watch the screen, okay? And then we're gonna have what's called two hot seats in front of the camera. And we're gonna switch out students to come up and say hello, we're gonna take turns, or if we have questions, I may have the two people come up and ask the questions, but it was all whole class because I was nervous. I was like, nope, we're going to do this all together. We're all going to look at the screen because we want to be respectful. That's fine and that's great. And the kids, when, the first, when they first do it, they're very excited and they're just, you know, their eyes are glued to the screen and just watching the call and they just can't believe someone is on the other line. And that works well. But after you've done it for so long, like we have, I've done it a few times over a year, my kids sometimes are like, well, you know how gifted kids are, their mind starts wandering off and lose a little focus, which is, you know, human. So I said, okay guys, we're gonna give you a job. They're like, well, what's the job, Mr. Tamport? Well, we're all gonna be a part of something because we're all gonna be part of this experience. And so you're gonna have your own job to contribute to this call, during the call. This happens during the call, but you have to prep them beforehand. So my favorite jobs that have worked for us, they just absolutely love being a superstar. And that's kind of the two people that I pick. If we have an interview to give, I put them in the hot seat and they stay there the whole time. And at the end, I'll introduce everyone else behind the scenes, I do that. But they're gonna be the ones in front of the camera the whole time, kind of like the broadcasters, they say, like a newscast, yes, yeah, like that. So they love that name, you can make up whatever name you want. A lot of people say greeters, you can call it whatever you like, just saying, you're the superstar, because you're gonna be in front of the whole camera the whole time. Another one they like to do is question keepers. When we have an interview or a game that involves us asking yes or no questions, you need to have someone to keep up with those questions. And I'm not going to do it during the call because I'm busy doing other things. So I give it to the two students who are my question keepers. And then what they do is they obviously keep up with the questions. Or what you can do with your question keepers too, if you're, just, you're talking to another class or a person, an expert, whoever, you can have them come up with questions they can ask during the call. So say you have a class of 16 kids. I don't hope they're not that large. Or even 10. The question keeper can be able to walk around the whole time. And say if you have a question but you're not in the hot seat, you're not a superstar, then the one question keeper writes your question down. And then he goes to the hot the superstars. And then at the end when it's time, do we have any questions? And then we give the questions at the end to the superstars. You see there's like a little process. So that not everyone's like, oh me, oh me, oh. So the question keepers can have a little clipboard and just walk around the room and keep those questions. So you can do that with question keepers. The runners, kind of like a similar concept to the question keepers but they're more so messengers sending a message. They don't have to have a clipboard like the question keepers do. The question keepers love having a little clipboard, but the runners, they like to move. <laughs> Those are your movers. So if you have a game, you're gonna see that in action later on. If you have a game like where you're problem solving as a group, 
and I had a large group for one of my groups. I had to divide them in half, but we were competing against the other class, so I had a runner for each team, and then they had to get, you know, get with the group and decide what we're gonna ask, what we're gonna ask, okay. And then the runner comes up when it's their turn, and they come to the superstars and give their question or whatever it is they're doing. So that's the runner's job, kind of like a messenger. And then you have, they love this job, I just introduced this um, just this semester, photographer and videographer. We have a class blog too, in my class, so they love taking part in it. And these pictures, most of these, are actually taken by my own students, by the way, just to preface that. They do a wonderful job. I give a digital still camera during the call, and I have my little flip cam. And I say, okay, this is, I give them a kind of prep. I say, you want to do this shot, you don't want to get too close, you don't want to be intrusive, but you want to get a good idea, a picture, take a picture of what's going on <coughs> during the call. And so that's their job. They're walking around with the camera and the flip cam, and they're taking snapshots, taking clips, and they love this job. This is a favorite. And another one is blog writers. Like I said, we have a class blog. So what we do, and they're right up here, they're the ones who are summarizing as our call is taking place. And this works very well because they're so focused on their job. They're the most focused people I know during the call <coughs> because they want to make sure they get it right. But I tell them, well, you enjoy, relax. I tell them, that'd be perfect. I said, you can write out in phrases. You can write keywords. It doesn't have to be in complete sentences. You just want to summarize the experience so that when we blog, we can just write bullet points about what you got out of it. Mm -hmm. so, and I told them you can write about what you thought, what they said, impressions, anything. I said just make sure that you have it so that you can read it afterwards. So they like this job, the blog writers. And then there's a new, fairly new concept. It's very ooh, out there for me because my, my idol, Silvia Tolisano, she does bad channeling. Do any of you during the conference, have you all been tweeting live from your session? So that's back channel. If you tweet live with the hashtag, you can use Twitter, you can use Facebook, you can use pretty much anything, any social media tool. That's what back channel writers do. So we also have a class Twitter account. And so I want to get to the point where I have my class Twitter computer and my channel, my back channel writer, because there's just one, I could have two, but my back channel writer is actually tweeting live while we're doing the Skype call. So that's, I think that's important too. They have to learn how to, that really puts them on the spot to summarize. So that's a good job. But we'll see, my friend Sylvia, she does iPads and she makes me use all these fancy tools. I'm like, well, we don't have all that, Sylvia. What do I do? She's like, you do what you want to do. She's like, you can make them right. I said, oh, I sure can. So she said, you can make it, make it as simple as you want. You can put it on paper or you can do it like with, with my own computer or my laptop, my extra laptop in the back and room or on the side and then just tweeting live. And you can also use what's called Edmodo. How many of you are familiar with it? Facebook with their students. So we're going to use that too. We can create a little group, a little Skype group, and the kids can get on and tweet live. So that's, that's a fairly new concept. If you're not ready for that, I totally understand because I'm still working on that myself. But I think that's important though for 21st century skills, for students to know that there's a larger audience than themselves, especially when someone tweets back, they think it's the coolest thing. And then other jobs too is uh, the timekeeper. If you're concerned about time, you have them look at a watch or they can set the timer if you want. And then they let you kind of give you like a little silent signal at the end to let you know or whatever. And they love that too. <clears throat> and the map keeper, if you're doing something social studies based, you can have them actually physically look at maps. So, and that's for more of a specific kind of call that I'm going to get into a little later on. So those are my favorite jobs and they love it. And then during your call, obviously, I like to introduce each class if it's the first call. I like to do like an introduction call. Especially if it's another country, they, they love that. They come up with questions beforehand, and they ask those questions too. I also like to use Google Maps. If you notice, this is actually a screenshot from my own Google Map that I keep. When I Skype with you, I add you to my map. These are all the schools we Skype with in the US, and then one in Canada. And so what we do during our first introduction call, what I like to do is I like to do, when you drag this little man right here, if you know how to use Google Maps, and you put him right on the location, you can see a street view of their school. So when I Skype with my friends, I say, send me your school address because we're going to take a tour. And so that's what we do the first time. And it works well when your, internet, when your internet connection works well. But I had a little glitch. When the internet was slow, I was like, oh, man, we can't see your school, guys. Sorry, maybe next time. But when it does work, it's really cool because you get to walk down the street, and then they guide you. Like our friends in, uh, what was it, I think Minnesota. They're like, make a left here. Make a right over there. That's our playground. They're just kind of telling us during the call. It's pretty neat to see our kids kind of navigate that. And then you have... Obviously, your Skype jobs are taking place during the call, and they can do it quietly. They can handle it. If you think it's going to be chaotic, it's really not, because they're so into doing their job right that they're just taking it real seriously like little professionals. So I, lo I love the Skype jobs. 
Then I like to save my interviews or questions toward the middle or end, depending on my call. And then, of course, you're sharing whatever it is you're going to share. If you're going to share projects, a story, whatever it is you do your activity during that call. But I think another important part that a lot of people miss, and I do this sometimes when I, when I first started, is the whole reflection process. We kind of just do our call and then we're done. But we want them to really reflect. Well, what could we have done better? I asked my third graders, well, what could we have changed for that game? And they told me, well, we should have positioned the camera differently. Or we should have done this. And they come up with some really good ideas. And I said, you know what? Let's write these down because they reflect on the whole experience. And they, they know what's going on. And they improve it, which is good. But also reflect on what they learned, too. And I'm going to give you some resources at the end that will help you do that. I have some printouts and things like that um, in my handout that you can print out. And then also data cleanup, like our blog writers, if their notes are so sloppy, I make them kind of recopy them, more legible writing, or they type them up too, we can put them on Google Docs. So there's a lot of cleaning up you have to do after you, you do all your data or whatever it is you're doing. And then of course number three is document. Those pictures that your, that your photographer took, those video clips, you want to clean those up too. And uh, if you do the whole blogging, I want to get my kids to the point to where they're the ones, I'm writing half the blog posts usually because they're just starting with blogging, they're fairly new. So I'm doing a lot of the summarizing and then they have their points at the end. So I want to get them to the point where they're cleaning up everything, their whole data, they're cleaning up their notes and everything. And then they're going to get with the videographer, the blog writers, I want them to get the, with the videographers and the photographers and select the best pictures, select the best clips or clips that you took, and then write a blog post as a group. That's where I want my students to be. We're working on that right now. But you can also do the blogging yourself if you'd like, if your students are not ready for that. So there's different things you can do. Now you're wondering, well, what do we do? I gave you an idea of how it's structured and where to look for partners, but here's the real meat of the presentation that I love. Here are just some ideas of what I do for different calls, different types of calls. And my favorite and my most successful have been with bringing in experts. I don't know if you can see or recognize this person over here, my favorite. Kristen Cunningham, we had the opportunity to Skype with her. She was the former host of HGTV, Design and a Dime. I don't know if you're familiar with that. She's an interior designer. She's now working on a show on the OWN network, Oprah's network. And so she, my husband actually follows her. He's been in touch with her. So he's had a relationship with her. And he said, hey, would you be willing to Skype with my wife's class? And she's like, oh, sure. And she was so sweet and so bubbly. So we loved her. And we, this is for a career unit that we Skype with her. And we had questions for her that were specifically geared towards interior designers. Because I told my students, if you're going to interview someone, you can't just give them just low level, you know, kind of basic questions. You really want to know what she does. We researched what interior designers do, the expectations for interior designers. And then they came up with a nice little list of 10 questions to really get to know more about her career, because that's what our career unit was about. So I'm going to show you quickly a little short video clip of her call. She's so sweet. I loved her personality. My students loved her, too. I thought she was so funny. Here she's talking about, we asked her, what was the best or worst part of your job? This was her response. Let me pause it real quick. Make it big. Hopefully you can hear it with the speakers. Glamorous or fun, it is flat out lying. Um, they're hot, long days. Anytime that you are in front of a the camera, there are hot, blasting lights on you, and I'm a sweater. So trying to look, you know, not like a sweaty beast all the time is, <laughs> is difficult. Um, and they're just kind of long, hot, awful days. But the best part about what I do is that it it's usually involves a makeover and there's a happy family or, or person at the end. And I get to make a difference in somebody's life and work with really great people. Um, but those days are the most, most of my days are production set days. The other days I have a blog and I have a website and I write for you know, different magazines. I do a lot of writing, so I spend a lot of, my, a lot of time in my pajamas, uh, which is great. If <laughs> you can figure out a career that you spend my work from home, awesome. The one thing I will say is you have to be very disciplined, and I'm not always. I tend to play with the dogs a little bit, drink a little bit of coffee, get a little bit of work done. Um, and then there are days, and actually this week I have three days. So that was just a little cliff, and she was Skyping from her home, if you follow her. That's, she has a beautiful home in Los Angeles, California. So that's just a little clip. You can bring in experts. You can bring in, uh, we brought in someone else for a business unit. This is April Stagg. She wrote a book on the career within you that's actually geared towards adults. And my students actually took her quiz in the book. And then they took it in and had no clue. 
And I said, well, what if we Skype with the author? And what, would you like to ask her? Because then after you take a quiz, as an adult, as, as a reader, one of her readers, she gives you nine career types that you fit into. And so we analyzed it, and I said, do you agree with your career type? Do you not agree? My kids were like, oh, yeah, I am kind of artistic. I do. I fall in number three. And I said, well, we're going to Skype with the author. You can ask what you want and see, you know, see what she says. So she introduced her nine types in kid-friendly terms. And then after that, they got to ask her questions. They thought that was neat. And that's the same thing with authors for books. If you're reading a specific book, a lot of times these authors are on Twitter. They have Facebook pages. They have, you can email them. So just try to build a relationship and kind of just kind of beg a little bit. <laughs> and hopefully they'll, they'll be willing. There is a website, I think. Um, you have to look at, I'll show you in my links where you can find that. There are authors who Skype for free for the first 20 minutes, but a lot of them are starting to charge. And it's not so good. But some will be willing to do it if you just ask. I think if you ask. And of course, virtual field trips through that CILC website. There was one by NASA, I think in June. It was so cool that during the World Cup, I think they were having a video conferencing and they were studying like the anatomy or no physics. It was something physics of the soccer ball or something. That would have been something neat to do with students you could have done with students. So those are just a few ideas. And then we have another thing you can do, obviously, cultural exchange. If you're doing a social studies unit, you want to learn about life in a different culture. It could even be regional. You would be surprised at how diverse we are in regions. I know one of my good Twitter friends, if you've been following Twitter, Paula Nagel. She's big on Twitter. She's here in New Orleans. She actually does a lot with Mardi Gras. She did like a Mardi Gras Skype project where she introduced Mardi Gras. Because even our friends in Canada, when we asked them, do you guys know what Mardi Gras is? They're like, mm, no, not really. So that's an opportunity for both classes to learn. We can present Mardi Gras as a celebration. And then they did a care package. I think Paula sent them a little king cake with some beads. So you can take those kind of opportunities. And I did that with my friends in Spain and Argentina. We sent like a little care package at the end, little pencils with our little district website, our little district website is on there. So little care packages like that, they enjoy that kind of thing. So that's a lot, that, this is when I taught Spanish too. You can see that the hot scenes in the front. I just love that look on the little girl's face. She's just so excited. I had them come up to the screen and say their name in Spanish or introduce themselves in Spanish. And here's our friends in Canada. So it can be, you know, just, and it's great for their target language. Or if you want your students to learn a language. I'm trying to set that up for my girls. My fourth grade girls are like, we really want to learn another language. Or just, you know, Skype with someone and have them teach you something basic. I said, okay. And so I put it up in my project. And we have a few people where it teaches a few phrases in their languages. I think I have Poland who's interested in Spain. Of course, they're going to teach you some phrases. So you can do all those kind of things during Skype. Pre-plan that. And then you have sharing and collaborating. Obviously, um, you can, we're so project-based and gifted that what I like to do at the end of each semester, if I have something that my students really want to share, I try to get with someone and say, look, you have like 20 minutes, it doesn't have to take long, we're just going to share what we have. And so we do that. We have their class share, and then we share, and then what we do afterwards, we kind of vote. My kids love to vote. They're like, oh, can they vote for their favor? I said, sure we can. And they love to do that. But I said, it's not competitive, it's just, you know, we try not to make it too competitive because, you know, I guess the kids can get a little <laughs> competitive. But I said, no, let's just let them vote for their favorite, what they liked. And so they really enjoy that, sharing their projects. And here we're just sharing a little project with our friends in New Hampshire. And up there, that's something else. That's a book club you can do. You can also do pen pal. It would work well. Skype would work very well with ePal or pen pals. If you do ePal, that's internet. Pen pal is snail mail. So that would be interesting to communicate with someone in writing and then as a culminating activity you can actually Skype with your class to see them face to face. I think that would be pretty interesting to do. I haven't done it myself. But we, we're trying to start these right here. Our book clubs or book, book talks. Because what I'm trying to do with my students is more literature-based units. And I've already found, through that Skype in the classroom, thanks to that site, I've already found a, at least one or two classes in each grade level in like one week. Because I put that out there. I said, I'm reading these books for second, third, fourth, fifth, and sixth. Who is interested in talking with us about these books throughout the semester? And already I have so many contacts. So you can do that as well. I'm going to speed it up because I think we're running out of time. Oops. <laughs> and here are more elaborate projects, more collaborative too in nature. This year, if you're on Twitter, there was something called the Global Read Aloud. And basically what it is is you get together. Well, you don't get together. It's like a wiki that you sign into. And what happened is, we, we chose uh, one person, Pernille Ripp, she's a fifth grade teacher now. She's on Twitter. She chose one book for younger elementary and lower elementary, I mean upper and lower. And so the book that we did with her was Tuck Everlasting for fifth grade, but you can do it for fourth, fifth, or sixth, it doesn't matter. And so what you do is you log into the site and you put your location on a Google map, and the whole premise is to read this book alongside people all over the world, classes all over the world.
They were mainly in the United States, but we did collaborate with classes in, we had our main class was in Delaware, because I follow her on Twitter, Lisa Mims. And then my second one, she got contacted by someone on that same wiki for the Global Read Aloud for someone in South Korea. And so what we did during this process, we were reading the book, we did what's called literature circles, if you're familiar with those. So we did our literature circles week by week, and we discussed with each other, and I said, well, why not do our literature circles with our class in Delaware? They're reading the same book, we're on the same chapters. So what we did was get with them, and we actually discussed that section of the book together. So with literature circles, what you have, we have like an illustrator who draws a picture, and then you, the other class had to guess what scene it was from the section of the book, and that's a clip I'm, a clip I'm about to show you just very briefly. And it was pretty interesting, because I blew it up again. It's up everlasting. Hi, my name is Kelly. I think this part is about when we, when Winnie and me and Jesse were on the boat together. Winnie and Jesse? Winnie and Jesse? That's their class, okay. answering our question. Nice guess. Let's try, let's try another guess. Uh, Gavin? Introduce yourself. I had a large class, too. I'm in the seven, and I think that there's a picture when uh, uh, we and Andy Tuck went on the little Let's see what Morgan has to say about that. Okay. What do you think, Morgan? That's correct. She said it. So they guess our, our picture. So you can do something that simple. We just you, you have if you do that anyway, like we were in class. Why not share it with your class via Skype, your partner class? So I thought that was a pretty amazing project. My students really enjoyed the Global Read Aloud. You can also do shared writing. There's so many tools. Google Docs, you can write a story on there, publish it as an ebook, embed illustrations, or even um, with Storybird. Are you all familiar with Storybird.com? It's a story. It's like you make your own little book. You select the illustrations, you drag them, and they're all made by artists. It's like a freelance type thing. And you just select your theme, like if there's a little alien theme, and then your students sign in. They can create, maybe they can write half of the book, and then your class, your other class can write the other half. And then y'all can read it via Skype because it flips. It's so pretty. At the end, you'll see the illustrations. So they don't have to worry about illustrations. All they have to worry about is the content of the story. So that's another neat activity that you can do. And then you have surveys too. People like to take a lot of surveys. They like to poll people. I know Paula did one. I wasn't sure what it was, but it was math related because she does math. And so she surveyed and she sent her Google form, because you can do it on Google Forms. You send people the link and they fill out your form and it prints out your actual results. And then your students could create a visual representation of the results in Skype. During Skype, you can sh actually share that with one of your classes. So that would be another idea too. And this is fairly new too. I've seen some people on Twitter, um, some gifted ed educators, who are trying to do science experiments. Wouldn't that be interesting? to really document, and you can take those notes on Google Docs and have your students log in and share their observations or do their experiment notes or whatever it is you want them to do. There are other tools that you can implement, though, when you're looking at these collaborative projects. So these are very neat. And then another one that's very engaging and very popular with my students is the Mystery Skype Call. We haven't done that yet, but another thing that's been kind of floating around Twitter a lot is when you Skype with another class, but you don't give out your location. Because see me, I like to brag. I say, we're going to Skype with Canada today. I'm so excited. And they're like, oh, they get excited with me. But for this one, I'm saving this one for our World Culture Unit. We're going to study Brazil and Carnival and compare it to Mardi Gras. That's my unit. But they don't know what I'm going to do. I'm going to tell them, we're going to Skype to someone, someone in the world. And your job, we're going to incorporate those Skype jobs I talked about earlier, is to figure out where we are Skyping. So you need to come up with some excellent questions to really narrow down the location, the country and the city. So you can do country if your students aren't ready, but I want to do the country and the city. So that's very good for geography skills because during that job you're going to have people, you know, kids on the floor literally with maps and highlighters. You can have some kids on two computers doing Google Maps. You can have a logical reasoner, maybe two or three, who are trying to, you know, keep up with, well, they said no. So if they're not in the northern hemisphere, they have to be in the southern hemisphere. So it's kind of like a call where you do yes or no questions. So then our kids would ask, are you in the northern hemisphere? And their kids would say yes or no. Yes, no. And so we would have to take that information and apply and figure out where in the world are our friends, you know? And so that I want to try that with my students this year. But that but it's been done mostly on Twitter with national. It's been usually nationally, but I'm gonna try it globally probably. I'm gonna try it, we'll see how it goes. But I haven't tried that one. But this works well with national because you can do states with that. And another one is my favorite is the Math Skype Buddies. I started that this year. And basically I have a 30 minute enrichment group at the end of the day. They're mostly gifted students. And the whole point of that is to get them excited about learning. 
And so we have a lot of games that we play. And I said, well, since we're playing these games already, why not take it to Skype? And so here's a quick little video. Please, my last one. I promise. It'll be my last one. But this one's a little more polished. This is an example of what I use to document. All right, if you're familiar with Animoto, anyone familiar with that? I love Animoto. It's my favorites. So this is what I actually put on my blog. And see the Skype jobs that actually put this on. Is it even or odd? Look at it. What is it, guys? Odd? Odd. Okay, Madison, ask the question nice and loudly. Is it over 50? Is it over 50? Is our number over 50, guys? No. 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 Our class, mark your boards. Question keepers, you got it? Okay. Give us a second, guys. Um, Olivia, why don't you come up with the Is it in the 70s? No. no. So you go back and forth, yes or no? Is it 21? Is it 21? No! Yes. Woo! <laughs> oh, good job, guys. That's awesome. You guys? And then guess right after us. <laughs> go ahead. Yeah! Oh, good job! <laughs> they, uh, they love games. And here we had like a lot of manipulatives too. Because they had to get 0 to 99. So they had a little chart and they had the problems. So I call them problem solvers. So I changed the titles around. So there's just so much you can do. You just modify it however you want for your students. And, and it could be, like I said, something simple. I already had these games in place. I had to do a lot of researching. It was just a matter of finding our friends in Nebraska. And that was through my Skype in the classroom site. I found her. She directly emailed me about that. And then we did this last year, the Rebus. I don't know if y'all do Rebus puzzles, a picture where you find out the words. My kids love those. And lateral thinking, oh, they love those too, to find like sideways thinking type puzzles. You can do those too. If you have your students research some or come up with some, and then you just share them via Skype. And my students love that. They really enjoy that. And just a few tips just to, I'm going to leave you with is obviously know your time zones. Time change is coming up soon, so I know I'm going to be confused, so just bear with me if you're going to Skype with me. <laughs> and um, test your equipment and program beforehand. Like I said, do those practice calls with a relative or even just a teacher in the school, whoever. But make sure it's all working, your sound is all set up, because you don't want to mess with that when it's time to get down to the call. You want to just get right into it. And you want to make a confirmation, of course, with your person. That week of, I usually email someone, I try to remind them, we're Skyping today, right? Or next week, or this Wednesday. And arrange your classroom too to make sure that your camera is facing if you want the whole group or just maybe two students. Like I've been doing just the superstars and then everyone else is kind of in the background. And then at the end of the call I get the camera and say, can I introduce you to everyone else behind the scenes? And then of course people are like, yeah, sure. And then I kind of go around and say, this is our photographer, this is, you know, so and so. And then of course document. As you notice, this is my actual professional blog. It's called Language Journeys. It's in your packet. This is our Hattiesburg School District blog and I put that same Skype video, the little game we play because I want parents to see, I want the community to see, I want other teachers in my district who are interested to get an idea, this is what you can do. And so usually what I, I kind of cheat, I cross post, I start here and I do my own professional and I kind of explain what I do on my blog and then I kind of put it on our, I put that same post and I just modify it some on our class blog and then up there I just, these basically have the same posts, people don't know that yet, but that's what I do here, I just copy and paste. So it's, you know, to promote because we have our class blog and then we have your district blog. And you want to document these things. You want to share. Just like people shared with me. They wrote their blogs and they shared pictures. I want to do the same. This is my way of giving back. So if you're interested, you can 
look me up. I'm at Twitter at lgift underscore gifted. Language blogs, that's my blog, and I usually share a lot that goes on with our Skype. And then here's the golden right here, the golden link. All Everything I say for Skype, if you're on Digo, you can follow me. I'm Elvira Dianport, it's just my name. And um, I keep all my bookmarks on this site. And it, this is the one with Skype. This is where I keep all my blog posts, everything you, that I talk to you about, it's all there. And then that last page that you see is actually a resource page. I came up with another little. And these are all my Digo bookmarks. I just wanted to put it on here for you in paper. You have a Skype help page. You have technology for kids. You have video tutorials here. This is a wonderful wiki. You have the Skype in the Classroom project. Once you sign up to Skype, you can look at that third one. It's only for members. But once you sign up, you're, you're good to go. Videos, and then all the sites I told you about, around the world with 80 schools, Skype in the Classroom, they're all here. And then down here, this is a Sylvia's packet under activities and project ideas. It's called Skype Call, Learning Call. She has handouts, a whole packet for Skype. She has maps that your kids could fill out, they can fill out what job they did that day to document, because they can themselves document that. And you can keep that all. She's put that all out there for us to share and to print. And then you have Projects by Jen. This is a great website. I just discovered it just recently, thanks to Paula on Twitter. And this is, they have some fun projects here for your kids to do. It doesn't have to be, you know, so, you know, content center, but it's more games, what she does. So you can do that. And then the last one, if you want to record, here are your resources down here. Retopo is free. And then this website is going to show you some free resources for Macs and PCs. So any questions? I know I went a little bit over, sorry. <laughs> I had so much to share. But thank you for joining me. You can have your places from the